Günaydın arkadaşlar. Duyabiliyor musunuz beni? Duyuyoruz. Merhabalar. Günaydın hocam. Merhaba günaydın. Thomas bekliyorum. Thomas gelsin. Ee, başlayacağız arkadaşlar. Tamam hocam. Günaydın arkadaşlar. Duyabiliyor musunuz beni? Duyuyoruz. Merhabalar. Günaydın hocam. Merhaba günaydın. Thomas bekliyorum. Thomas gelsin. Ee, başlayacağız arkadaşlar. Thank you. 
Hi, Thomas. Hi, Salim. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? How are you? Well, I say good morning. I know it's um, nearly lunchtime where you are. Uh, it's it's almost 11 here in Turkey, but it's still very early for you in the morning. Yeah, thank ne nearly eight. Morning. Thank thank you for joining us early this morning. We do appreciate your efforts, your contribution to this course. OK. Yeah, thanks. And I thought I would make I would make an effort and dress up because I knew you would be looking as dapper as usual. <laughs> Thank you. I think you are the, the best dressed man in academic integrity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this compliment. OK. So we, we still have one minute. Uh, we have just started live stream on YouTube. And this session, as you already know, will be available on YouTube for the others, for the other audience. Uh, hopefully uh, there will be some other people listening to you and maybe asking you questions at the end of your session. Uh, we have a moderator there on YouTube as well. Uh, so, if uh, there are any audience who would like to ask questions related uh, to contract cheating, uh, they are more than welcome to ask their questions on YouTube. The moderator uh, will be informing us about these questions and hopefully, uh, if we can have time at the end of the session, uh, we would like to answer these contract cheating related questions. Okay, it's 11 o'clock here. It's uh, 8 o'clock early in the morning in the UK. Uh, I, I guess we are ready uh, to start, Thomas. Uh, yeah, th thank you, Salim. And it's great to be here. Thank you all for joining me wherever you are in the world. I have a lot of windows open on my screen today because we're live on YouTube as well as live on Teams for Salim's class. So if I don't monitor everything, feel free to catch up later. And if you're a student in the class, then we are aiming this towards you today, towards your research and the work you have to do in the module. So do ask questions, do discuss things as well. I will hopefully switch the view over to my screen nice and seamlessly. Um, and Thomas, yeah. uh, sorry, sorry for the interruption. Before I, I leave the stage for you, I'd like to briefly introduce you uh, to, to our audience today, if you don't mind, please. And I'd like to relate today's discussion uh, with, with our previous classes. Is this OK for you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. however you'd like to run. And just to check, we have 90 minutes. OK, yeah. I, just, I just need five minutes for this introduction, and then I'm going to leave the stage uh, for you. Brilliant. OK. I'm just uploading the document. I guess you can weave it right now. Oh, well, it isn't there right um, within hand, but but yes, there's a teaching award I won a few years ago. Yeah, okay. yeah so, so this, this is a nice photo that I found mm. on your page uh, for, for indicating the award you received. Hi everyone, today we are welcoming Dr. Thomas 
Lancaster uh, from the United Kingdom as our honorary guest for academic integrity policies course at Chanakalyon Sigismund University. Before we start our discussion and before I leave the word for Thomas, uh, I'd like to briefly mention about what we are supposed to be doing today. First, I'd like to introduce Thomas very briefly, but it's going to be a very brief introduction because he did an amazing job so far. So there is a lot uh, to talk about Thomas. And I'd like to especially call uh, your attention uh, with his recent publications, recent academic uh, integrity related and contract cheating related publications. Later, Thomas uh, will give a definition of contract cheating to us, and uh, he will try to illustrate the difference, uh, the, the line between collision and copying, relating it with plagiarism, where, where plagiarism starts. And he will also refer to the current state of research, especially in this era, uh, considering both academic integrity and contract cheating relevant to this. He will refer to some research uh, findings and also uh, with regards to recent developments recent technological developments hopefully uh, i guess uh, we can now detect contract cheating in addition to detecting similarities so uh, there are some tools available maybe we, we can find time uh, to discuss the effectiveness of these tools and then uh, we will conclude the session and welcome your questions at the end of the session. Okay then, who is Dr. Thomas Lancaster? He is one of the world's most prominent researchers into academic integrity and contract cheating. He has been working in this field uh, almost for the last two decades. Uh, previously, he focused on the detection of plagiarism and later in uh, 2006, he managed to publish a paper with late Robert Clark. The paper was the, uh, was the first one uh, introducing the term contract cheating. So we are very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Lamas, uh, Thomas Lancaster here uh, as the man who coined, coined the term contract cheating here. Thomas is widely involved in international developments in this field, of course, uh, holding several advisory positions, including for the United Kingdom Quality Assurance uh, Agency. Uh, his background is uh, computer scientist uh, specialist, and uh, within this regard, he worked widely across the United Kingdom uh, related to academic integrity positions. He is now working uh, as a senior teaching fellow at Imperial College London in the United Kingdom, and he is focusing on student support there. Uh, he is delivering an interdisciplinary mod module aimed at encouraging undergraduate students to become academic integrity researchers. So what we are doing in this PhD course is uh, promoting academic integrity and increasing awareness uh, of, of the academics uh, in this field or, or prospective academics in this field. And he is also doing this at very early stages uh, for undergraduate students at his own institution. Previously, he has altered and delivered several uh, other related courses, such as Avoiding Plagiarism. It was uh, one of the book, uh, book for students as part of Sage Super Quick Skill Series and also uh, he, he contributed to Epigium's Academic Integrity e-learning program. As you already know, Epigium uh, is cooperating with uh, Oxford University Press uh, for their publications. When it comes to his uh, data-driven research into contract cheating, it's wide-ranging, but uh, mostly uh, his recent research uh, is focusing on wider operation of the contract cheating industry, a substantial and complex global operation employing thousands of workers. And uh, if, if you'd like to uh, retrieve more information about his publications, uh, we, we suggest you to visit his webpage uh, that we uh, list here. Okay then. Remember, in the previous week, 
weeks, uh, we already talk about global degree mills or diploma mills. And we indicated, we highlighted that it's not a new phenomenon. Indeed, it dates back to 1920. So we are not talking about the recent problem when we talk about contract cheating or when we talk about uh, academic misconduct here. And remember what we said related to plagiarism, we discriminated accidental plagiarism from intentional plagiarism, especially with reference to uh, Howard's text writing. Text writing, for example, for especially uh, students, international students, could be the indicator of academic uh, writing skills. Uh, of course, it should be developed, but could be the indicator of uh, academic writing skills. However, uh, it is quite different when it comes to intentional plagiarism. Therefore, if we are talking about contract cheating, I guess there is no way to put it under the category, category of uh, accidental plagiarism. I'm sure uh, Thomas uh, today will explain this uh, very carefully by clearly, uh, by uh, drawing the clear lines between plagiarism and uh, cooperation uh, and also indicating a collusion uh, to this discussion. What happens if we plagiarize? What happens if we do not pay attention uh, to students cheating, uh, cheating becomes this uh, deception, which becomes fraud later and uh, results in corruption. So if we'd like to, as we already discussed this previously, if we'd like to avoid corruption in the society or in the academia, then we need to pay attention uh, to the problems at the early stages, otherwise, uh, it will become much bigger problems that, uh, that we won't be able to handle later on. Okay then, the stage is yours, Thomas. Thank you uh, in advance for your invaluable contribution. Okay, thank you, Salim. It was a very nice introduction to really set the scene for everything we're going to look at today. Uh, for the students on Salim's module, please feel free to ask questions. This is very much intended as a session where we've got lots of opportunity for discussion here. Uh, and I'm interested in what you would like to know as well. So I have slides, but I can't cover the entirety of 14 years of contract heating research over the course of about an hour also here so there's lots more to go into that we can look at as we go through the session i will switch over to my screen if i had the the option appearing which doesn't seem to be where it was in my version but okay i'll do it a different way i will i will switch over there and hopefully the screen appears in a in a window as opposed to the multi-participant view. If you can all see that, feel free to type in the, the chat box and we will we will get going. All right. Salim, are you nodding? Yeah. We, yeah. we, we see it, Thomas. Yeah, I'm going I'm, so I'm going through a slightly different bit of software so that I can show myself and a backdrop and everything because I'm not um, usually quite so proficient with teams because it tends to disagree with my system a bit but i think we're there uh, salim has said a great deal of great stuff about me um, better than any introduction i could have given in this area but i am very involved in the wider academic integrity field not just contract heating so feel free to quiz me about that i deliver lots of talks i do work with the media to raise awareness in the area and um been working as you can see with lots of students over the summer uh, been doing academic integrity research projects we hope to publish and share some of those at upcoming conferences as well because to me it's very important it's not just us as academics who are telling students what to do saying do not cheat we have to involve them actively in the discussion and making the decisions along the way so really important to get the student involvement and i am still publishing uh, 
in this field, I started out very much looking uh, just to what contract cheating was. We didn't write our paper, Robert Clark and uh, and Robert Clark and I, back in 2006, expecting it to be the definitive paper on which contract cheating was based, as you may tell if you read it there. But we're very glad it spawned this range of interest in what is, I think, the biggest threat to academic integrity that we can see in universities today, wherever we are in the world. And recent work I've been involved with, collaborating particularly with uh, international colleagues as well, and as Sally mentioned, looking at how this industry operates. We are talking about a contract heating industry that is doing hundreds of millions of, uh, of euros or whatever currency you choose to use of business every single year. So that industry has a vested interest in making sure it is successful at the expense of academic integrity for our students. Uh, I'm also teaching a module on academic integrity with, academic de in uh, with undergraduate students as well. So a lot of these slides have come from my undergraduate module, but I have um, add added a bit more depth to them as well based around what I think you're covering in your module with Salim. So some questions for you to think about as we go through, um, really, what is contract cheating? How do you want to define it? There are different definitions in place. Does it really matter if we think about this? Because there are so many challenges we have to address right now, uh, not least how we teach students, how we help them to, to write, how we help them to write in English, how we help them to avoid plagiarism, as well, so it's just one of many extra challenges on top of everything else. Uh, how is contract cheating research positioned uh, within academic integrity research? You may also want to think about how is academic integrity research positioned within the wider field of educational research and assessment research as well. Uh, what is the current research? It's been going on now for 14 years at least, depending how you want to define this field. What challenges are appearing that we have to address as educators and what can we do based on these research findings? So just a few things to, to think about there. So what exactly is contract cheating? Back in 2006, Robert Clark and I published a paper on this. You may well have read this. Sully mentions that you've had um, a massive pack of papers that he's prepared for you to read there of which I guess is the starting point for this. Bear in mind that this is a paper written um, written 15 years ago, published 14 years ago, and this field has moved on quite swiftly since then. But we were looking in the paper and the associated talks around this area at sites like the one at the top right of the screen, cheathouse.com does exactly what it says. A student could go to this site and find essays and papers, uh, not ones they'd written for themselves. We had ghost writing services, uh, so contract cheating providers, as I would uh, name them nowadays, like Elizabeth Hall Associates, which was based uh, in the same city I lived in at the time and worked in at the time in Birmingham in the UK, uh, actually run by a former member of staff from that institution. Uh, it still operates today, bills itself as providing a premier service with very high quality writing as opposed to what you may get through other providers. Uh, you could go on eBay and buy people's previous essays, their previous dissertations and reports. You still can, but uh, buying pre-written work, which is already in the database of systems like Turnitin, is less valuable for students nowadays because they're likely to be detected as having attempted to breach academic integrity. And then the most important one we looked at was a site called Rentacoder. A perfectly legitimate site. This is a book which was released slightly afterwards showing how businesses can use sites like this to hire people for real tasks, such as you want to have some computer programming done for your business, you want to develop a new website for your business, you want to employ an international worker, probably at a very low wage compared to the one you would pay locally, then you would go to a site like Rentacoder. Now, 
rent a code doesn't operate at the moment. It has been uh, bought out by other services since. So the closest one now is a site called Freelancer, which essentially is the same service there. But there are many other ways of buying work. This is just one example. It's one we use for that first study. And that's why Salim in his introduction mentioned I do a lot of data driven research. So I try and find uh, evidence that is already available online. So for the case of Rentacoder, we could see the requests that students were making to have new original academic work done for them. And so we could go through them and classify them and look at who was providing the work at the other end, uh, look at how much people were paying. So that's the type of evidence that is available through this particular route. Now, really useful thing that was silly mentioned as well in the introduction, this is not new. The term contract cheating is new because we did introduce that one because it uh, met what we were trying to accomplish at the time. But there are examples dating back for at least 100 years. Uh, it, uh, and who knows how much further? Who knows uh, for any piece of work, whether it was the person whose name was written on it who did the work, or whether it was a friend, whether it was a family member, whether any payment changed hands or not. And this is an advert in a US student newspaper from 1972. Uh, it was very small in original adverts, so the resolution, I'm afraid, is not great on your screen. But you will get the idea that you could go to um, this site based in Hartford, Connecticut in the United States, and you could phone them up and they would send you term papers, so essays, which you could hand in. And there are examples in the literature saying things like, uh, before class, there would be students waiting on the steps to a university building for a company representative to come over and hand them the work they had paid for. The big difference between now, what wasn't there in 1972 that made contract cheating so easy and accessible for all students, uh, made it possible for us to do this online webinar today, what wasn't there was the internet. So you couldn't just get an immediate turnaround. You would have to put your order in and wait for this to come back. So you would have to plan in advance to cheat in a way that you really don't need to do today. And that's why we're seeing this equivalent view in 2020 of very prominently advertised services online and offline as well that are there helping students to breach academic integrity protocols. Some of them very much based around in, in English uh, saying, we know you're struggling, COVID-19 is there. We won't let it harm you. We are there to help. We are there to make sure you get the grades you deserve. And we like you so much, we're reducing our prices by 50%. Um, and of course, we want to get your email address so that we can keep marketing to you again and again and again and again. It doesn't say that bit directly on the advert, but that is the underlying marketing message behind these funnels. Uh, you can have much more about that in my wider research as well. Uh, sites like Fiverr.com, where there are writers there who are just saying, we will do your work. You can connect directly with a writer rather than going through a company. Therefore, meaning as a student, you can pay less money because you're connecting directly and there's not a service in the middle that's taking this. So the one there at the, the bottom of the screen, somebody who's done 26 pieces of work before, has a 4.9 out of 5 star rating, six orders in the queue. Uh, and they probably done a lot more work than this. It's just that the, the gigs, as these are called, change regularly. So often the previous feedback is lost. Uh, Adverts on Twitter, very, very prominent there, the kind of things we can help you with. These sites often advertise themselves as providing plagiarism free work, which is really essential for students looking to buy from them because if it's plagiarism free, then it's not likely to be caught. And what they mean by plagiarism free are that a student is going to get work which has not previously 
um, that is originally written, custom written for them. Uh, of course, it is plagiarism based on the wider definitions you may have seen about plagiarism because it is not something the students have written for themselves. It's not their own ideas. And they most importantly haven't acknowledged that writer who replaced them as part of the process. Uh, now, this is looking at science in English. You can see science operating in other languages as well. You can see local adverts now in many universities that often get put up on notice boards if you're not careful and you don't go around quickly and remove them. So what is the definition of contract cheating? These are a few definitions from the literature. Um, I've put on the top there, really it is a variant of plagiarism and collusion because a student is plagiarizing, they're getting unoriginal work for them and they're colluding with somebody outside the marking system. But very early on, we've used several different phrases to refer to this. Uh, a paper title we used, the outsourcing of assessed student work, because that's what it is, a student is outsourcing themselves. As I mentioned earlier, a perfectly legitimate business process, but not one that we want students to use. Uh, it's the process of someone else completing an assignment for a student there, uh, often with money changing hands, but not necessarily. Uh, Michael Draper and Phil Newton from uh, Swansea in the UK, they came up with the term, a basic relationship between three actors a student, their university, and a third party who completes assessments for the former. Uh, that's another way of, of framing this. So you have to have the student involved, you have to have a third party involved. I will go further and say that third party may be a whole group of people because of very complex operations in these systems uh, and, and the university who of course wants the student to do their own work as does their tutor and all the people associated with this. And there's a good guide in the UK called Contracting to Cheat in Higher Education, advising higher education providers, so universities, what to do about contract cheating. The, the phrase they use, a third party completes work for a student who then submits it to an education provider as their own. But you probably see going through this, the idea there's a third party involvement. Uh, there is a student trying to get one over on the system and a, tr a student trying to get work completed they haven't done for themselves. There are a few nuances in this system. For instance, what happens if a student requests work but doesn't hand it in? Is that contract cheating? Um, so things like that to think about or they, they um, the work they get back is not very good there. I, but I think as soon as they attempt this process, contract cheating starts. There, Likewise, there can be things like contract cheating going on in exams. So we're all here in a, a COVID environment, certainly in my department. Our upcoming end of term exams are going to take place remotely online. We don't have any cameras pointed at students or anything like that. So it would be very easy for a student to involve somebody else in this process should they choose to. And so we rely on students operating with integrity. We rely on our own, rely on our own um, ways in which we can detect this and look for things that are out of place. But clearly this is not going to be a foolproof solution if somebody sets out and wants to cheat. So. I have a bit of a question for you. Feel free to type this in. Um, how do you think plagiarism compares with contract cheating? Is one of these a more serious area than the other and one that we should be more concerned about? Um, they are variants on a similar theme after all. So if you're a student, feel free to type this in. I'm also looking at the YouTube chat, but I know that is about a minute behind the live broadcast. And there's an interesting question about cryptocurrencies, and I'm happy to come back to later as well on there. Uh, so any thoughts on that? Uh, Thomas? Yeah, Salim. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Maybe at this point we can encourage our PhD students uh, to respond to your question orally because uh, they will be able to join us uh, uh, from Teams. So maybe we can we can encourage them to talk a few minutes about what what they think 
about the differences between plagiarism and contract cheating. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, I, I, that would be great. It's great to okay. see some more people. Okay. So this, please this, go ahead. Dear students, it's, it's your turn to contribute. What, what do you think about the differences between plagiarism and contract cheating? And not, not only differences, but how you relate or how you discriminate these two terminologies from each other. What do you think? Uh, Hatice? Good morning. <laughs> And hello, uh, I think what I believe, and also I have mentioned to you that I have a little bit of uh, literature review on the subject, and I have uh, had a look at the industry in Turkey very briefly. Of course, I need to go much deeper. But I think uh, plagiarism, well, contract cheating is much worse than plagiarism because uh, well, when we assign uh, students some work, we expect them to write because we need them to assess if they have gained certain qualifications. Uh, when they plagiarize, well, it, which can be also unintentional, uh, it just refers to their, um, it shows that they're not really qualified enough. But when they do that, when they are involved in contract cheating, uh, they would also reveal, well, that would reveal nothing because contract cheating is very difficult to detect. So maybe that would mean that they would uh, gain qualifications they do not actually deserve and which would cause a lot of problems, I think, in the uh, long term. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. And it's really great you're doing some research as well locally, because that's one problem we have with the research base in this area, that we don't always have local case studies and know exactly what is happening in different countries and different languages. But that word intent is so important. You can accidentally plagiarize because you don't know how to write in your own words and how to reference and you need to gain those skills. And we can help students with that. But it's very hard to accidentally send your request out to a third party to get the work done uh, or to pay them to have the work done. So that, that idea of intent is a really great one to bring into the discussion. Miranda? <clears throat> Miranda, you might be muted. Yes, I am. I was muted. Thank you for warning me. So uh, I think both are serious. Uh, plagiarism is serious. Contract che cheating is serious as well. But the fact that contract che che uh, cheating promotes a development of a market and it involves third parties and is becoming such a normal thing to be approached by a certain layer of uh, students this makes it really serious and this makes it really different and this is why it should be approached and handled with more care by researchers <clears throat> uh, yeah and there is definitely a challenge there that there are some students and i want to stress it's not the majority of students it's a small group who think that contract cheating is perfectly acceptable and they view the end result of their degree as being important. They don't view the route taken to get to that degree and all the learning we've structured uh, as being at all important there. And we need to think about why that is in how we develop our courses and engage students along the way. But uh, there is a side issue as well, that sometimes students arrive at university having contract cheated before they, they come to us. And so therefore, what have they learned? They've learned how, how to cheat and they've lacked some of this fundamental understanding. So we also have to work out how we engage with them when they first arrive to help them with that. Yeah, so very good points there. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, so I just want to add something. So uh, you just said, uh, so it is not accidental. Uh, so, and when we define plagiarism, we say it is intentional and unintentional. But so when we look at contact cheating, it is uh, absolutely intentional. So it's uh, it's like and 
you know, it causes us to uh, go uh, on our lives, uh, you know, uh, for example, when we start telling a lie for the first time and we go on telling lies in our lives in the future, it's something like that, I think, so, and it prevents us to uh, research in the future. Uh, and it's an easy way to, uh, you know, ha hand something uh, to our institution or our uh, school, etc. Yeah, and so what happens is what starts off as a very little lie then builds up because you're lying about the knowledge you have. Yes. You, you may even as a student be thinking that you've learned this for yourself because you got the, the marks for it and you passed. And Salim mentioned at the start about how you're linking this model with corruption. And I've certainly seen that in research around various parts of Europe as well, where sometimes there can be countries where they have a culture where small elements of corruption are perfectly acceptable. So it might be fine to speed in your car. That's a perfectly normal thing. Or or it might be fine to just pay a small amount of money to get an advantage in a situation but then corruption builds up on other elements of corruption and so it's very hard to get uh, an ethical understanding and integrity once that is done and these look very small in in terms of the wider problems people have in their life so yes and and also so they are related but they are not almost the same thing plagiarism and contract cheating and so what we are trying to prevent or the way we uh, try to prevent uh, plagiarism doesn't work uh, uh, with uh, uh, fighting against contact cheating. Yeah, so there can be some very good recommendations in the literature for how do you design out plagiarism, but they don't work at all for contract cheating because they, d they don't take into account who is actually doing the work in the end. So it doesn't mean we should stop thinking about them because we, we still have to help the students who are um, accidentally plagiarizing because it's often hard for us to tell whether something was intentional or not, but we can't just be complacent and only rely on those. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Richard, may I add one more point? Please do, yeah. Uh, uh, from Speaking from a national perspective, of course, uh, contract cheating services are mostly provided uh, or used for uh, theses uh, or dissertations in Turkey, from what I understand from my little research. Uh, so we, they buy their degrees, students uh, of uh, graduate students can buy their degrees to some extent, we can say that. And then uh, these uh, graduate students uh, can turn into academics in the, in the future. And also, again, as Salim Mujam has uh, stated, this can turn into fraud or much worse problems because with these degrees bought, these people can become... Uh, academics who teach other students at university level and also they can these academics also can buy uh, I don't know uh, articles for example publications for themselves so that they can ga gain credits this is also offered in Turkey for uh, academics again let me say so this becomes a very big problem at the end so I can see that people can buy uh, book chapters for or um, articles, research papers, uh, so that they can gain some academic titles. This is another the the uh, worst part of the problem in Turkey, I think. Uh, yeah, you've picked up on some really valid points there. That if a if someone becomes an academic, becomes a professor, a lecturer, and they've not completed their own work, then how are they going to be able to teach students to do this for themselves? Because they've just not got those skills. And we, we can even see deeper levels of corruption there. We can see, as my Southeast Europe research has shown, where academics then may actually encourage students to go to certain services um, and they can get a commission from that or even little things like they can tell them, you have to come and buy my book and um, you, I'm the only person you can buy it from. So essentially you're handing over money, otherwise you're not going to pass the course. But we can definitely also see services online that are offering to write research papers. 
this has not been quite as thoroughly studied as the issue to do with students. It's a really interesting area to go into in more detail, uh, but it can be very low cost. There are other ways this can be done. For instance, that you can uh, you could directly pay for the research to be done for you. You could pay to get the placement in a journal because the people have got links with the reviewers to make sure that something gets accepted. Uh, I know somebody who essentially works as a translator for people who don't write in English and translates their papers from well from Chinese in this case to English but part of the deal is that person gets their name on all the papers so essentially they're getting a lot more credit than they should for doing something but there are all kinds of ways to inflate your publication count should you choose to and probably to publish some good research and that can happen just in a, a regular university setting as well where uh, people get their names put on papers they've done very little work for because it's an honorary position as a head of a research lab or something but contract cheating particularly um, problematic and something we need to think about and that journals need to uh, to do more about but what we see is there is a link it contract cheating is not just something that happens for students it's only a problem with education it's not just a single student that suffers it's a problem that then moves into the the wider realms of society because what happens when all these underqualified academics go out there, underqualified doctors, underqualified architects, the people who we depend on in, in our life, underqualified police who then think that a certain level of corruption is acceptable. How do we deal with this wider problem? Bearing in mind, uh, we, we, can, we can tackle this at the university level, but there has to be a wider push here as well. Uh, at that point, I'm going to continue on with the slides, but thank you for that really great discussion, purely because I'm conscious that we have um, we have more than enough material to fill the time, as is always the case. I could I could talk about this area for days, but I do want to show you this the idea of collaboration, collusion, and copying that comes from Fintan Colwyn and Jeff Naylor. Um, Fintan Colwyn was my PhD supervisor, uh, but this predates my my PhD, which didn't start until 2000. Uh, and they discussed the idea that there is a scale on which students work and often we encourage students to collaborate. We want them to talk to each other. We would like them to discuss ideas because that's how they learn, uh, just like we have in this discussion here today and sharing our opinions. But there is a point when uh, things become collusion when people are sharing work between themselves and uh, those words may start being shared and this can become plagiarism. Now it's a bit of a grey line or a moving line as to where this point occurs there, and there is a further point when people have definitely copied from one another and you are seeing plagiarism in student work that you can't possibly avoid there. But with contract cheating as well, we can really add to this this scale and say that a student is colluding or copying from somebody outside the direct students on their course. And I think it's a useful area to bring up with students to say that we encourage collaboration, but we discourage any form of cheating to go with that. I do want to look more specifically at the contract cheating research base and I think I'm going to share with you something that I've not shared in a talk before. I've shared it with my own students and it's the basis of some um, work I'm hoping to have published later in the year. But this is looking at the wider academic integrity research base and I found 8,507 papers on academic integrity published between 1904 and 2019. There, that's the earliest date I can find something there. This is excluding blog posts and presentations and non-peer-reviewed work. Uh, and it may not surprise you to find out that a lot of these publications have been done in the last few years because just in general the amount of research published has really ballooned uh, it's much easier to access as well but the kind of words people were using the the, the two word phrases or bigrams as we'd use in linguistical terms um, in those paper titles have been ones like academic integrity, academic dishonesty, and you can see various other ones along the way. And I think it's interesting just to highlight some of those terms 
some of the very positive sounding terms, academic integrity, academic honesty, uh, used quite often in something like 1500 of those papers as being the way we talk about this. But at the same time, we're seeing some, uh, so let's say, much more negative terms, academic dishonesty, academic misconduct, actually used more than the, the terms about integrity and honesty. And I've certainly talked in that way as well. A lot of my papers have used the term academic misconduct because for some reason that became a very popular term in uh, UK research. Academic dishonesty became a more popular term in North American research. It's interesting how those bases have diverged. and It's something you might want to, to think about. But most often we are presenting this with a very negative viewpoint. Um, so just, just, just something to think about there and uh, to show this is a very researched field in general, uh, but we are most definitely focusing on um, this necessary part of the discussion today, which is contract cheating. We can't avoid it, but it'd be nice to think about how we can focus the discussion on integrity and how we can promote that culture in the work that we do. And it's all about reframing it, but it, it's tough because I can tell you as soon as you say, uh, I am running a talk today on academic integrity. You get very few people turning up in a general audience. As soon as you say I'm, I'm offering a talk about cheating, uh, people are really interested. They want to discuss it. They want to join you because this is the area that gets people engaged. So we sometimes have a bit of a balance between the two. But this really brings me on to our main point here is contract cheating. Uh, very few papers published in, in this field compared to the wider area. So there are lots of opportunities to do more. You can see the other areas that expect in that in that graph, higher education, plagiarism, uh, case studies, even high schools appeared there. But very little about contract cheating associated with all these areas and I won't open this one out to, to a wider discussion, but why have so few papers been written? And partly it's purely because of the time frame that people have been working on the, this research area. So we can't go back to 1904. There are, uh, there are a few papers before 2006 that have written about contract cheating, but use terms like ghostwriting or essay mills uh, there. But generally, it's because, quite simply, it's a recent field and it is a recent concern that we haven't operated on swiftly enough. And something that really stands out to me, if we were to group these publications together, there were as many papers published in 2019 as there were in all the years between 2006 and 2015 put together. There is a driver for that and one driver is that a lot of this research has come from Australia. Australia had a, a contract cheating scandal. They had a site which the, the media, the Sydney Morning Herald, got into uh, which was used for contract cheating. They saw the various records of the people using that site, mainly students uh, operating in, in Chinese. And so the Australian sector was then forced to do something about it. And this also spawned a lot of new researchers to enter the field from Australia. At the same time, we have seen lots of people interested elsewhere in the world, in Europe as well. Uh, a few in the United States and North America, but not so many publishing in this field. But uh, we are getting more research now than we've done in most of the history of contract cheating being a valid area. So it's a challenge if you are working in this area because things are changing rapidly in terms of keeping up with the research. But there again, we're still looking at very few papers compared to other areas of academic integrity research. It's still quite possible to do a literature review in this field and cover uh, uh, at least everything using the term contract cheating. There are other papers which have mentioned contract cheating, for instance, in the, in the paper itself, but not the title or in the discussion or have said this is something we may have to look into in the future. But these are the ones which have really embraced this field of research there. 
We've touched a, a little bit on the area about why contract cheating happened already, but I want to look at this essentially balance scales reasoning, which I use quite a lot, to say that the students have to make an active decision to choose to cheat. Uh, it's not like plagiarism where it can be accidental. It, it's You can't accidentally contract cheat. You might say you didn't realize it was wrong, which is perhaps a motive or perhaps something we have to consider about how we address that. But I think deep down, most students know that they should be the one doing the work here. But essentially, a student will compare the risks. What will happen if they contract cheat? What will happen if they don't contract cheat and fail? Uh, and the potential reward. So what are the risks in many of these scenarios? Uh, often the risk is, you, um, is very low if you think you won't be caught because your lecturer is not going to look for that or you know other students who have cheated. Um, often the risk of failure can mean that um, if you fail, then you will have to do this work again. You may have to pay more fees. You may have to pay additional years of living costs before you can go out and get a job and earn money. Uh, whereas if you cheat and you get caught, the worst thing that is going to happen is you fail and you do this again. So really, on the scale of things, this isn't a risk because you are no worse off by, by cheating and chances are you'll get away with it. So therefore, there is a reward financially. There is a potential reward academically in that you may get more marks than you would have done. There is a reward in terms of your time because you can spend that time doing something else. And so therefore, this tipping point moves towards reward in the decision that many students make uh, as opposed to risk. We need to think about how we change that decision. There has been plenty of published research in this area as well. I, I go back here to a study which really informed a lot of my PhD. In 19, this was in 1996. It's not the only study of this type by Franklin Stokes and um, Newstead and Armstead. Uh, they surveyed students and asked them why students cheat. Uh, they gave reasons in general which are very similar to the ones we know are true for contract cheating there. Uh, students said in, in rank order pressures of time. They said they did this to get more marks because they didn't think they'd do that well for themselves. Uh, there was this perception which we have to think about how we address that lots of people were cheating. Perhaps even, as you mentioned in the discussion, that the academics were taking shortcuts. Uh, they did it help somebody else so we do know in the contract cheating research as well people get friends and family to do the work for them because after all let's think about if you're a parent your students at university um, it reflects very badly on you if they fail things uh, you want them to pass and to do well so you can help them with this uh, and then way down the list but um, this perception that people are lazy which i don't think is a reason we should think about but maybe we think about this in terms of pressure. Uh, Alexander Amagerd and uh, I did a study that was published last year. We looked at an alternative data source, particularly based on contract cheating. We looked at tweets and the reasons students gave in their tweets to say why they were choosing to contract cheat. And again, these are just the top five results. They've been grouped. You can read the full paper if you like. But the single biggest reason we saw is students got to a point where they thought they could no longer pe persevere with this and things were just getting um, just getting beyond them for various reasons. Uh, could be the pressures they're under. Uh, but we also saw people who said this work was just too hard for them. Uh, and that they, they couldn't do it, so particularly in areas in wider studies um, like things like mathematics, sometimes basic writing skills there as well. How do we make sure they have the academic ability to succeed and they've had this support before they start as well there? So those are some of the reasons given. It's, it's a complex area. It has been very well studied, though. You can find another 100 papers looking at this, but generally the reasoning is fairly consistent at a meter level as well. I'll share with you a few general findings too. As I say, there are lots of papers on contract cheating you could choose to read. Um, our very first study back in 2006 
we looked at the site Rentacoda and we looked at, for instance, where were requests coming from? Uh, something of hopefully of interest to you as people doing this, we found a small but uh, large enough to classify group of requests coming from Turkey, even back at uh, that time period, usually for requests for work in English, in, incidentally, because they were the ones that we could find. These were things that we could trace back to a particular university. I'm not going to tell you which universities, but uh, quite a range of universities across the country as well are there. But I think um, some of this information now becomes a bit dated. It won't surprise you that countries like the USA obviously have a lot of students, a lot of universities, so they're going to be unduly represented in those results. But we, we also found when we looked back at the profile of these people making requests that the largest group of them, this wasn't the first time they'd done this. They'd made between four and seven previous requests for work before we started doing this research. So it wasn't something that sometimes people say students just cheat once or they do it out of desperation. Often it's the case that they cheat once and either they can't do the work because they missed out on previous learning or they found out that actually um, it's a much better choice to cheat because we know we can get away with it and we won't be caught. And that trend still takes place to this day. Uh, contract Bob, cheating. I, yes, Salim. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for the interruption, but I guess uh, it would be nice to talk about uh, the impact of language here before we, we move forward. What do you think? I mean, especially, uh, you, you know, my students are from English language teaching department. Um, we are training EFL teachers here. Uh, it, it would be nice for us to identify the role of language. I mean, you said that the requests from Turkey uh, were in English, in English language. That, that's there, right, there, yeah. There, there are some universities and there are some programs, for example, uh, at our PhD program, it's completely in English. So uh, the, the students technically uh, can ask for, uh, for for the other people to write assignments in English. I guess it, it could be nice to to check the role of English. I mean, English as a first language, English as a second language, English as a foreign language. So if we can speculate about the numbers, uh, there are roughly 305,000 uh, English L1 speakers speaking this language as their mother tongue. And there are other uh, 350 people speaking English as their second language. We are talking about the African countries, for example, or India or, or, or some others. And there are some other foreign language speakers, uh, roughly around 2 billion people. So technically, uh, all these people can exchange uh, their assignments or can, can, could be working on the help of the others all over the world. However, the situation, for example, specifically focused on Turkish language could be a bit different. I mean, if someone uh, is asking for an assignment to be written in Turkish uh, to a contract cheating company, to an essay mail, it, it, it should be based in Turkey. However, the situation for you in the United Kingdom might be a bit different. I mean, for example, a student uh, might be asking for an assignment from someone who is based in India, for example. I, I guess, or who is based in uh, an, an African country, for example. So this makes the situation a bit difficult, more challenging for you in United Kingdom. So I guess, especially focused on restricted in Turkish language, uh, it could be easier for us to control the situation here because uh, we will mainly need to focus on uh, SA mills operating in Turkey, operating in a Turkish language. Of course, uh, there will be some uh, instances related to the other languages, uh, such as you gave in the example. What do you think? Well, I mean, you've really, in your, your summary, covered a lot of the speculation that I would say already. But what we know is that certainly there are contract cheating providers operating in languages other than English. There haven't been that many studies. There's been a bit of work on Cheshire in particular showing this local operation and it 
tends to be the same at a local level as the meter level we would see about English. The difference is you will have a smaller pool of potential writers to call upon. But what we would see, let's say, in English, and um, I've, I've done, done wider studies that look at this, is that most writers for contract teaching providers in English operate from Kenya, which um, people they have very strong English language skills they will work quite cheaply compared to someone, let's say, operating in the UK. Their, uh, their, their, their economy has pushed them into taking this kind of work. And there are also government pushes that saying they should join the gig economy and they should do work from home type jobs, of which writing essays is a perfect one. And so we have people who are incredibly qualified. They can write more than one essay a day there and they get used to writing them in a way that student that our universities want to see them um, so they get a lot, lot of business going that way so you see that level, level of operation you may see companies operating claiming they deliver a higher level of service or that they have all local writers obviously it's very hard to to verify exactly where the writer comes from because usually a student and a writer will not talk to each other directly there will be a company operating in the middle uh, through which all the communication is filtered at a local level what you may get is people operating in a local town that happens or a local city that happens as well. You may get graduates from a particular course who by the end of the course know exactly what is needed for success in that course. So um, the type of job they choose to take is to use their insights. They know what the lecturers ask for. Uh, they know what type of assignments will be set. And so therefore they put these, uh, they set up a local business um, operating, providing work for students at a particular university. But there are still potentially a large pool of writers operating for that, um, uh, that local situation in the local language. Uh, another thing we do see as well, which is uh, the use of translation services. So essentially you can pay for work in any language you want and translate it into another language or you can find um, or you can plagiarize in a different language, translate it uh, into the local language and you can even then pay somebody to go through and edit it and improve the standard of writing and you get a grey area between where does uh, editing and proof write, proof reading, where is that acceptable considering you may be editing or proofreading something that a student hasn't written for themselves in the first place. Uh, a fascinating area that could be a whole other hour of discussion in its own right. Okay. So, thank you, thank you Thomas for, for the clarification indeed uh, related to translate plagiarism. Uh, on the European Network for Academic Integrity, we have a team working on uh, testing uh, these systems. So, uh, unfortunately, text matching software uh, cannot cannot uh, identify the similarities uh, between the original language uh, and the translated language. I mean, uh, there are some some systems, or very few systems, partly identify the similarities. So. Uh, this is a problem, this is a technical problem and in addition to translation sometimes we can see nativization. I mean uh, lo localizing the situation as, as if it, it was conducted in another study so it, it's, it's getting it uh, more difficult uh, to identify the problem. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, and this is with my computer science hat on. It needs more sophisticated systems than the ones that simply match words and see if they're the same. So some machine learning type systems, a bit more natural language processing there. But that is a whole other session. I'm, I'm just going to briefly look at a few sources because you can go back and read the original papers, which may help with this discussion because I know you are as part of the module looking at research studies and comparing literature. So a bit of signposting here to go with it. Uh, Phil Newton's work, uh, he did a meter review of surveys of students where he found that out of recent surveys, 2014 to 2018, 15.7 percent of students said they would contract cheat. Now this is a very large number 
the proviso I want to give you here is that not all students are, uh, are equal in this discussion. Uh, I sometimes think we over rely on survey research. So for instance, in this case, these numbers are overinflated by certain countries where perhaps the, the, the view of uh, cheating being acceptable, um, more people view cheating as acceptable. Uh, so not every country, not every university, not every academic discipline is going to be the same as this. I also think, and I've seen this in several studies recently that are published, that these surveys rely on questions being translated into multiple languages and sometimes the translation can be imprecise and so therefore students answer slightly different questions to the ones we think they're answering. So I believe this is an overestimate in many cases, but that's not to say there aren't uh, a sizable number of students who are contract cheating there. Uh, another study from uh, Rigby and colleagues in the United Kingdom used economic theory to ask students in what circumstances would you contract cheat? Their conclusion was that half of all students would be willing to do this, providing certain criteria are met. These criteria vary from student to student, but essentially it comes down to that risk reward scale I showed you earlier on, that they will weigh up the risk of being caught. They will consider the pricing. Pricing in general is cheap and they will also um, weigh up what mark they will get at the end. But students will not rule out cheating. Uh, likewise, I've already mentioned this is habitual for many students. Curtis and Claire in Australia, uh, they surveyed students and they found that students who said they had contract cheated, 62.5% of the time had done so more than once. So that also backs up the idea that for the majority of students uh, who choose to contract cheat, this is not do once and forget it. Uh, Relating back to all of these, some of my recently published research uh, in the International Journal for Educational Integrity that uh, in English it can be cheap to pay for work. So I found a price point of $11.46 United States dollars for buying a 2000 word essay using a micro outsourcing site called Fiverr.com uh, and I found most of the writers who were doing the work were from Kenya with smaller groups from Pakistan and Nigeria. There are other countries involved as well, but these cover the vast majority of all the writers. So students who want to get work done for them cheaply in English don't need to pay a lot. They may pay a lot more. They may go to a flashy website uh, that makes it look as um, if they are paying for top quality work. Uh, some of the ones operating within the UK may make it look like they're hiring a writer from Oxford or Cambridge. But deep down, often it is the same writers operating for this type of pay level. There is just a company in the middle taking more for this. Students will pay more for this. Another recent study I was uh, a co-author with, with Alexander Amigood, we looked at how much students said they would pay on Twitter. The price they said they would pay was much higher. So students don't tend to realize they can get this work done cheaper. They said they would pay $66 for 2000 words. Some crucial findings though, separate to that, most of the requests we saw were for mathematics, not necessarily from students studying mathematics as a degree, but from students who had to do maths modules or they had to apply statistical techniques as part of their degree, but maybe lacked the skills. Likewise, there are a lot of very low language writing type tasks in there that don't necessarily require you to be an expert in the area. We also found students asking for people to take exams for them. And I want to stress this data is pre-COVID, so the numbers are likely higher now that so many exams are online. I often get asked what academic disciplines are most involved in uh, contract cheating. And essentially, it comes down to two disciplines. Business tends to be the single most requested discipline where we can see the requests made by students. So this can include work up to MBA level. It can certainly include high level master's level dissertations in there. 
often it seems to be things where students care about the end result. They care about getting a promotion at work because they're already in a job and they're doing a more advanced study than uh, lower level work there. Or at least um, these are over represented because companies advertise towards these type of students because they know you get requests for a dissertation. It's going to pay you more because it's going to be a continual process than if you get a request for a single essay. We also saw a lot of requests for computing work in there, which obviously is a concern to me as a computer science academic as well. But, but various other areas. So this is a meta study of various earlier studies there. The work students buy may be good, it may not be. Lisa Lyons in Australia paid for 26 history essays. Some of them are undergraduate level, some of them are postgraduate level. Got these all marked and this is the scale of grades from, pay, from fail to distinction level. So a student paying for work from the services Lisa used does stand the risk they will fail. So nobody can guarantee a pass. This is a message we should pass back to students as well. But if you choose well or you get luck on your side, you could get very high quality work. Quite often from my research, I know that what does a writer in this field want to do more than anything? They get paid by the word. So they want to do work they can complete as quickly as possible. So if it's standard work that they've done before, so in the business field, things like first year business assignments tend to be very standardized. They can write it quickly. They get paid more, so they will gravitate towards that type of work. This is this is an example of history, probably something I don't write about as often. So therefore, they're not as specialized there. But you still see writers who do want to do a good job that they take pride in their work, just like we would take pride in our work as educators there or perhaps they charge slightly more and so they feel they have to give it a higher level service or perhaps they're just generally interested in learning that happens as well that's a motivation for many of us it can be a motivation for writers as well so you can get distinction level work out of this process too uh is, is research always good and i've sort of touched on this already so i won't go through this in depth but i do want you when you review work as part of reviewing literature, you have to think about what were the underlying motivations for that work? Um, what are the flaws? It's great we're seeing much more research being published in the field, but sometimes there can be a challenge, particularly with survey research, that students have a difference between the perceptions, admission, and what actually happens. So we can see questions in surveys that ask, what do you think other students do? That is not the same thing as saying what the students actually do. We can also see questions like, uh, have you contract cheated? And students may not always be willing to admit this because they may think that uh, if they admit it, that we secretly will know who they are, regardless of how well planned our research design is and what type of ethical approval there is. Uh, they may think that they don't want to make it look like a lot of students are cheating, so they won't say this. They may also think it's perfectly acceptable. I know other people do it, so I'll just say I do it, and that can overinflate the numbers. So it's sometimes very hard to compare survey numbers. We can say uh, these give us an indication, or we can see they give us an estimation valid in certain circumstances. And I want to give you an example here of something which has now be started to be cited as fact from a paper. Uh, a survey of students where students were asked um, what type of tasks do most students contract cheat in? And lowest in the scale they had were reflective tasks. So saying you've done your work, now reflect on what you learnt. And so some people now will start to quote that as fact that fewer students cheat in reflective tasks, so we should set more of them. But that isn't what the results say. And, in, and to be fair to the authors, then some of these authors have also started to tweet and say that this type of task does not guarantee that contract cheating does not happen there. But what this, uh, this type of scale says is that people think students cheat less in reflective tasks there. 
why would students know what type of tasks other students choose to contract cheat in most? So it's a question we can ask and we can take into account and we can think about, but there are all these services that are gear they're advertising about writing reflection. And in fact, I worked with a TV company a few years ago. They purchased an essay for nurses uh, asking them to reflect about something they'd learned in their training. The, the results we got back were good, quite superficial, but they had some quite realistic looking examples of things nurses might have learned. So, for instance, in this case, they, they talked about dignity and that patients need to be treated with dignity when they were taken to use the bathroom, which is something that might be obvious to us, but they said didn't happen in the nursing facilities they worked in. But this person never worked in nursing facilities. This was just a standard example they could find anywhere that will pass the criteria. So often reflective type tasks can be very easy for companies to reach. So we just need to uh, sometimes treat these res results with caution. And there are certainly flaws with some of my research as well, particularly if you look back and you say, is something we wrote about in 2006 still reflective of the trends today? So a little bit of a checklist here. Uh, but it's also a motivation for you to do more localized case studies. Is contract cheating research always valid? Uh, and you could also say this is true about academic re integrity research in general, but it may be valid in a certain university, a certain country with a certain type of students. It may be very valid at the time it was done, or it may be valid based on a certain interpretation on how questions are asked. And so it's useful for us, and I certainly encourage more localised studies because that's the thing we're lacking in contract cheating research. But what I don't want us to do is just take the results of a survey as being completely definitive of every student or every academic around the world. Every student is an individual in their own right. Uh, so we sort of asked this question, does contract cheating matter? And you gave some really great answers for this about uh, it matters because other academics may contract cheat afterwards. They may be independent. Uh, I know of academics, incidentally, in our wider research, who pay other people to write their lecture notes. We've seen examples online of, of people who have paid, um, just paid a random person online to do their marking for them. And that may be smart, depending on your view. There's certainly marking I would prefer not to do, but as a professional, it's something I feel I should do because they are my students. I want to give them good and valid feedback to help them to improve. I want to draw your attention to work from Zenith Khan and colleagues in the UAE, published very recently about reasons they found about the consequences on wider society that come from students' contract cheating. So it includes what are the problems to the student themselves? Uh, they've not benefited from all the teaching that we deliver for them, that they may suffer from anxiety. They may suffer from a feeling I'm at risk of being caught. That happens to a lot of students that they certainly, if they take, if they are caught, then we know of students who get depressed because they don't know what's going to happen for them. Will they be thrown out of the university? Will they have to admit this to their parents there? So it's very stressful for them. Obviously, we don't want students to be in this position. It may be perfectly deserved, but I would rather we never have a student go through this. Longer term, they found some quite crucial and uh, dangerous problems that may occur that if contract cheating goes uncaught and we don't address this. It can be as simple as they can't keep a job. That, that, that hopefully is obvious to all of us. If you cheated through your degree and you've not got the skills you say you have, you go into the job, you can't do the job, then a company will not want to keep you there. But uh, associated area not necessarily picked up in, in this study is this also reflects very badly on universities. And so you'll have the associated effect that uh, a university will uh, if a university is known that their students have not got the skills they say they have, then employers will not want to hire those students. And it reflects badly on the university sector as a whole. But there is a whole surrounding area, you've picked up on this as well, that this unethical practice can continue, but ultimately there will be a skill gap. And alongside all of that, students find the whole process is incredibly stressful if they are found to have contract cheated. I do want to 
I sort of point out the work by Pitt, Delegan and Sutherland Smith. Again, I mentioned work being published very recently. I said it's published up to 2019 because that was a natural endpoint for a completed year. But there's been a lot of research published in 2020 as well. But students are very stressed if they go through this, um, any kind of hearing, conflict cheating hearing, also plagiarism hearing. How do we support them? But really crucial, students can be blackmailed. Once a writer knows the student has cheated or a firm knows they have cheated, the firm can contact them and say, send us more money or we will tell your university. Most students are completely unaware of the risk of this. But what happens? What do we do if students are found to have, um, if students are at risk of blackmail? Do we help them or do we punish them because their contract cheated? There difficult conversation to have. Uh, so I want to conclude and then we'll open this up to discussion by thinking about what can we do about this and I encourage you to look at the slides. There is work about detection uh, and I, you should think as well about how this translates into your local languages. Can we look at student work and pick out if a student has written it for themselves? Is it written the way we expect them to do? There are various computer science techniques as well, which I talked about in a recent keynote, which you can find on my YouTube channel if you want to know more about these. There, uh, should we trust students? We can come back to this, but I think we should be trusting our students, but we should have safeguards in place because it's not fair if some students cheat and get away with it to the other students we work with. Uh, we should think about the various solutions that are available, including I mentioned working in partnership with students earlier on, really important to us. Uh, we should think about the writing support students have, hopefully uh, an area you're very keen on, because students don't arrive at university as fully formed writers. Uh, and can we use computers Wade in this. So tools like Turnitin can be useful to helping the students who accidentally plagiarize, but we don't want students to become dependent on such tools. Lots of people push the idea of legal approaches that I think you're picking up in a later week as well. There, it's um, it's useful but dangerous is all I will say. But can we also think about the emerging challenges in this field? And unfortunately, as a computer scientist, I see the emerging challenges happening all the time, particularly to do with artificial intelligence systems that now write text that is very realistic and looks like a human could have written it. And so when we discuss the idea that you can't always detect translated plagiarism, that uh, problem is uh, multiplied many times over by these type of systems there. There are also wider concerns in society that we have to think about because we're interested in integrity and ethics about surveillance. If you point a camera at somebody during a, an online exam to make sure it's them, does it change the way they operate? Does it put them off? How do we deal with that and also ensure that integrity is uh, upheld? So. I encourage you to work with students. Think about things like we have an International Day of Action against contract cheating every year, where we got uh, people like the students at Dury in Greece, uh, uh, acting students helping to produce videos to encourage integrity. What would have happened if Shakespeare had plagiarized there? Question for you. We had some really great student panels involved. We've got my students involved doing research, but there are all kinds of things you can do with student partners. I guess as PhD students, you're also student partners, but you also have that really great viewpoint that you are both a student and you are supporting and teaching students for this. And what do you think we should do next? And what will you do about contract cheating? And that is a right point to throw this out to you for thoughts and questions and ideas. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, I'm sure we all have some questions to think about in our minds and uh, we, we still have some time to discuss that. But before uh, I give the word to our students and to the audience, uh, I, I'd like to uh, refer back what you said about academic integrity policies. Do we give our priority to the detection, to reaction, or to the prevention of academic misconduct or, or contract cheating? Uh, in the previous weeks, uh, regarding all 
policy development, academic integrity policy development, uh, we, we said that we, we will be giving the priority to prevention by the help of pedagogical approaches. Okay, we see that contract cheaters, especially uh, under the impact of behaviorism, for example, uh, they, they realize the relationship between stimuli and response, so they are repeating this action. However, uh, from the previous research, we also learned that uh, even contract cheaters or plagiarizers uh, may change in time. So, if we are supporting, if, if we provide support to these students, there's still room for student, for these students uh, to develop good academic uh, po policies, uh, academic writing skills, so that uh, they can write their own assignments. Of course, we'll be dealing with the legal issues later. Uh, hopefully, uh, if Michael Drucker joins us, uh, he will he will give some uh, good ideas about the legalization, especially in the United Kingdom, because in Turkey, unfortunately, uh, we, we need to uh, find a way of developing some uh, legalization of, of uh, contract against contract cheating. So this seems to be a problem right now. But of course, there are some tools which might be helping us, such as Turnitin or Plexicon. Uh, both these tools, uh, in addition to indicating similarities between uh, submissions, they also claim to be uh, now uh, identifying the author's identity. So uh, this is it is their claim. Uh, there is no research uh, investigating uh, these tools right now. So we need to investigate the effectiveness of auto identity tools in terms of uh, detecting uh, contract cheating. I mean, or a, a, a helpful tool for the detection of contract cheating because it won't automatically detect contract cheating, but give some uh, give some ideas to the lecturer uh, about it. One more thing that I'd like to highlight here, you mentioned the interaction between reward and risk. If you are talking about the reward here, okay, I'm a student, I fail. I need to know that next year, if I am repeating this course, I will be developing my skills. So it gives the lecturer some responsibility, reminds us the responsibility of the lecturer. What are the course outcomes? If there is something wrong, if there, is, if there are some weaknesses related to the lecturer, I mean, if the students cannot foresee that they will be developing, then uh, considering the motivational aspects of our students, this might be encouraging our students towards academic dishonesty. So as lecturers, we need to be very careful about our course outcomes, outputs, so that uh, we, we guarantee our students that they will be developing if they are taking this course. Otherwise, we might be misleading them towards academic uh, misconduct. And another issue uh, for uh, with regards to the uh, BA and postgraduate students, especially in Turkey, uh, we, we, Higher Education Council is encouraging the implementation of text matching software and they are providing uh, free access to Turnitin. But uh, such, such requirements are valid only for postgraduate students and only for thesis. So it means that uh, there, there, there is implied meaning that uh, we don't need to worry about assignments, postgraduate assignments. Only, only focus on thesis, which might be a wrong interpretation. And what happens under at undergraduate level? We don't need to worry about undergraduate level. This this shouldn't be the message. Indeed, uh, one of my PhD students, Özgür, is uh, studying developing academic integrity policies at K-12 level. This should be the priority. I mean, we need to we need to teach developing. Uh, academic integrity or promoting academic integrity before university because uh, thinking about behaviorism, this will become habitual uh, for students. Uh, so uh, this will help us uh, prevent, uh, prevent the problems in the future, I guess. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Salim. You've um, just want to say you're very lucky having Salim teaching in this, someone who's so passionate about this area and so involved with all the research going on 
internationally. You've picked up on so many valid points. Academic integrity is for everyone, not just for students, not just for lecturers. It's for the people supporting students, the people setting policies as well. It's for our um, governments to consider uh, how they address it. And in terms of policies, we need to make sure our policies are fit for purpose and that they do mention contract cheating or the appropriate local terms. And they do set out what will happen in those circumstances to go with that. And most certainly there is not one single solution to contract cheating. Uh, we need to look at all these areas. We need to think about detection. We need to think about deterrence. We need to think about how we work with students. We need to think about what type of assessments we set to make sure students are engaged. And we need to keep this research going. And I see the comment in the chat from Miranda. Um, I'm glad you found this useful, so thank you for that. And certainly localized case studies to me, that's the one thing that I would like to see out of this. I'd, I'd like to think just before we finish as well, I'd like to pick up the question that came through YouTube because that's been sitting there for a while about the number of webinars that link between between contract cheating and cryptocurrencies. So really interesting area. So you have companies that are asking students to pay by Bitcoin uh, rather than pay through credit card or PayPal. So. The companies are moving towards this because officially PayPal has banned payments being made for contract cheating services. In practice, it's um, not as good a ban as you might hope because often PayPal don't know what the reason is for a payment, so they can't block this. But clearly, the more visible evidence we have and we can access the student is paying for work, then the more likely the student is to be caught. So therefore, providers will say to students, go to the dark web, send us your money through these less traceable, I won't say untraceable, but less traceable uh, ways of doing things like cryptocurrencies, and then you're removing the risk. But this still isn't risk-free to students, despite what they may think. Somebody could steal their money. There's not, and there's no recourse if this happens. Uh, the value of cryptocurrencies changes regularly. They can go up and down in value because they're not linked directly to stock markets or anything like that, or to national currencies. But a student is just as much at risk of blackmail and extortion as they would be through any other route. Uh, but I don't think this is a massive problem because I don't think most students are yet set up to use cryptocurrencies by default. It does have a learning curve to it, but it is something that is available that we need to be aware of in, in future years. And um, yeah, and we have a hand up there as well, Salim. Yeah. Uh, yes, please, that's good. Yeah, great question. Thanks for that. The whole idea about detection, again, is a wide one. And often what we look for to show that a student has contract cheated is we look for more than one piece of evidence. When we take these individual pieces of evidence and put them together, it gives us a good indication on the balance of probabilities that the student hasn't done the work for themselves. So I do think the keystroke patterns has a lot of potential there. There are things we can look at, for instance, where a student is writing their own work, they are likely to type a bit, then they're likely to pause and think, then they're likely to type a bit more, and we will see that pattern. If a student pays for work, then what we'll see quite often is they will just copy and paste a big chunk into their essay. They may do a bit of editing, they may put their name on it, they may tidy it up, they don't always do that, uh, but we see a different pattern. 
Likewise, if they're plagiarizing and they're copying chunks from websites, or, then we see a different pattern as to how they copy and paste. So I think there is a certain amount of individuality there. Uh, I don't think it is something we could use as a sole indicator. Likewise, we can look at things like what form of words do students use? That's another indicator in terms of style. Uh, there are even, even studies I've seen outside the contract cheating field, but which could be applied, looking at things like how much pressure do people put on the keys? That's another indicator because I tend to type quite heavy handed. Some people are very, um, very light handed. We can consider areas like that. So there are all these indicators. They all show promise, but none of them are, are quite there yet. But we have to keep working on that. Thank you all again. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for this very fruitful session. Uh, we, we all were enlightened. Uh, we do appreciate all your efforts uh, in joining us early in the morning. Uh, let, let me check YouTube if there are any questions. Uh, uh, it seems that there are no questions uh, from YouTube. And if there are no further questions uh, from the audience on Teams, then I guess uh, we can finalize the session. Yeah, I will. Yes. Thank you all for joining me. I hope it's been useful. Thank you also to the YouTube audience. It's great to see these sessions being broadcast more widely. Now we're so interconnected. It's a downside from contract cheating that everyone is interconnected and everyone is easily accessible. But from the point of view of education and research, it's great. And just hearing about the the research that the students are working on, that you're you're working on, and the plans and everything, and just seeing a module like this exist. There are so few academic integrity modules which do any more than just saying, here's how to reference, here's how to write anywhere in the world. And um, this is one of the very first ones, along with my one that I'm uh, offering for undergraduates at Imperial. So it's brilliant to see this activity going forward and i wish you well with it so thanks everyone thank you thank you Ethan. thank you okay then hope to see the other audience next week for the other topic thank you once again uh dr thomas lancaster uh it was our privilege uh, to welcome you here bye-bye thanks goodbye thank you see you jim see you